the market, particularly over the last five years, uh, re refurbishments uh, have been, uh, well, let's say, let's say all the rage. Uh, but refurbishments uh, have a sort of natural cycle. I mean, most hoteliers will tell you, you know, five to seven years is kind of shelf life on uh, particularly things like soft fabrics and furnishings, you know. So hotels do need a refresh every few years. Because Dubai and particularly the you know, UAE and particularly Dubai have uh, almost uh, been designed and delivered in unison, it is uh, very natural that the cycle would then take you into a refurbishment uh, age around about the same time. So if 10 years ago there was you know, 40 new hotels, you know, conventional wisdom says 10 years later, you know, a good portion of those 40 hotels will be up for refurbishment and I think that's uh, what's happening now. But although there are rules of thumb for all of these things, uh, there are no rules per se. Uh, there are no laws per se to say you need to refurbish after this uh, amount of time. When an owner decides to refurbish, it could be for a multitude of reasons. Uh, to be a little bit more competitive, um, to, to fix maintenance issues, to uh, you know, enhance the property, to uh, absorb some of the latest technologies, uh, or to potentially even become more sustainable. Uh, so there's varying degrees of refurbishment you know, in the refurbishment cycle and lots of different motivations uh, be behind all of that. So uh, it's not about uh, having too much or, or too little. Uh, it is just uh, assessing properties uh, as to whether or not they actually uh, need it and also whether the owner has the motivation to do it. You know, there are plenty of hotels around the world that have probably been ongoing for 20, 30 years without any significant refurbishment. Uh, this, I would say, as a hotel designer, uh, is, uh, is really an aspirational target uh, to hit. I would love to tell someone that a hotel I designed has been you know, around for 20 years untouched. Why? Because that means it's timeless. I mean, it, it resonates culturally. It means, of course, it's still generating revenue. So it, it's doing all of those things that we as hotel designers uh, really uh, aspire to do. If your hotel has been refurbished in three years, you should maybe take a step back and think about how good your uh, design was and how well it was put together and whether the investment, time, place uh, and offering of the hotel uh, was, uh, was, was the right thing. The design opportunities in, ad in adaptive reuse are, are huge uh, and they're huge for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one of which uh, is that uh, sort of uh, value, that cultural value that uh, a heritage building or a historic building or any building for that matter uh, has existed within a certain place, time, environment and context uh, and the people that occupy those buildings ingrain a history uh, within its walls, you know, that if these walls can talk what would they say? And that's such an interesting conversation to have in existing buildings as opposed to a greenfield site where uh, you're sort of inventing constraints and parameters of design uh, almost uh, out of thin air. Existing buildings provide uh, a context and a constraint which you know, some designers will resist constraints, but we actually at H plus A, we kind of celebrate uh, these constraints because we like to build narratives uh, around things that are relevant and existing, but there's nothing more relevant than an existing building. It's there, it has a history, context, culture. It has materials, it has a certain patina of concrete that you can only hope to recreate uh, in, a, in a new building. So there's, there's a lot of poetic value uh, in existing buildings. More pragmatically, uh, there's existing infrastructure in buildings. So conventional wisdom says that the, the initial capital expenditure is less because you're not having to build the structure from scratch and bring utilities and, and all of these kind of things, uh, which of, of course uh, contribute to uh, the bottom line of, uh, uh, of an owner. Uh, and then there's the environmental dimension. Uh, greenfield projects, uh, are uh, they generate a lot of waste and we all know that buildings uh, are a, a large contributor to CO2 emissions. This we've known for nearly 20 years now. I mean, who knows, the Green Building Council was established in 1993, so it's a long time ago that we know uh, these, these things. And, and especially in a climate like the Middle East, anything that we can do to reduce the environmental footprint uh, on a project is beneficial and that's where adaptive reuse uh, can come into play uh, and be of some, some benefit and, and deal with uh, all of these. Now, all of that said, in the positive light, there has definitely been a slow absorption rate with adaptive reuse uh, here. There is still a, a cultural stigma, I think, around the old, uh, and uh, you know, new is still uh, somehow uh, preferred. There is also the fact that Dubai is a little bit of a victim, and I'm talking about Dubai now specifically. Um, Dubai is a little bit of a victim of its own success, and what I mean by that is that the infrastructure is so good uh, in Dubai that the availability uh, of land is still quite ubiquitous. So there is not that uh, objective demand to be in any one particular place. 
uh, you'll uh, live in the marina and work in Media City and then go to uh, have dinner downtown and you move fluidly and seamlessly. So we still look at a place like Dubai as citywide, it's not necessarily neighborhood based, where in a place like New York, you have to be in Chelsea right now. And if you're not in Chelsea, you're, you know, you're, you're not on the, on the map. Here we don't have those same pressures. So clients will, uh, based on the availability of land, based on the fact that they can still have Dubai as an entire catchment no matter where they are uh, as a hotel, uh, they, are, they are quite comfortable on a greenfield site sort of, um, sort of anywhere in the city. So uh, you know, in that respect, uh, there, there's a poetic value, uh, there are some pragmatic concerns, um, and there are some boundaries uh, culturally. And, and the last thing I'll say is also legislation and building codes uh, evolve so quickly and rapidly here that these sort of legacy buildings uh, are definitely not uh, up to date. And it's not to say that authorities uh, are not open-minded to uh, have the discussion around those things, but there are some buildings that it's just so fundamentally non-compliant that even as an owner, you might not want to take on uh, that, that risk. So there's a, a lot of opportunity for adaptive reuse and we encourage our clients to, to do that, um, but we certainly see the boundaries uh, at the moments that need to be broken. I look at these challenges uh, a little bit more philosophically than pragmatically. Any markets, and I, and, you know, and I always hate to use the term markets, but you know, in the end we are uh, you know, architects, designers, uh, supporting com commercial ventures, and those commercial ventures uh, succumb to uh, pressures of markets, right? And uh, there are natural cycles to any uh, economic cycle. Uh, if you uh, are fortunate enough to uh, have a great project at a peak, it's fantastic, but if you uh, also have a fantastic project opportunity uh, in a bit of a slump, uh, you have to be a lot more uh, creative. So I, I, I think less so about that because that's an inevitable uh, challenge that comes every three or four, uh, four years and we all have to work around that. I would say one of the biggest challenges we have here is changing the mindset that design is not a commodity. And I know that sounds a little bit controversial, but you know, we, we uh, sometimes are seen uh, as though we're providing a service like any other service provider. I think uh, as architects and designers, uh, you know, our ego does come into play a little bit to say, yes, we have a very pragmatic role in delivering drawings and documentation and have to comply with statutory codes and meet budgets and all this kind of thing. But those are the basics and the fundamentals. Where designers add value, and I'm talking about designers now in the, in the true sense of the term, they add value in their ideas. And how do we assign value uh, to these ideas? We haven't really found a, a way to, or, or at least in you know, discussions in the, in the wider industry, you know, how do we turn that corner that you know, someone comes to you first and foremost for your idea and not about simply the service uh, that you can provide. Uh, and this is, uh, like I say, a little bit more of a conceptual challenge than a pragmatic challenge. But uh, you know, I think it starts with us understanding that there is value behind that and that we are not uh, only uh, we're providing a service on an hourly basis but instead we're providing innovations and insights. You can buy a canvas and paint for you know $25 uh, at a store but a Jackson Pollock canvas you know is valued at 30 million dollars. Architecture and design has an element of that you know I won't go so far as to say that that's the, the value that we uh, subscribe to but we have to understand that there is a value to, cre to creativity and you know, uh, St Steve Jobs, uh, you know, an Apple phone is a little bit more uh, valuable than a, than a Samsung phone, not only because of the technology inside, but because of the innovations and research and development uh, that go behind it. We spend a lot of time as architects and designers refining ourselves, educating ourselves, um, you know, keeping up with uh, the latest and greatest in any of our respective fields. You know, design is a lifestyle for us. It, it is not a vocation. Uh, and so all that energy and effort and brain power um, at some point needs to be compensated. And I'm not talking about financially. I mean, fees will be fees. That's not what I'm talking about. It is just uh, the, the, the cultural value of it, the celebration you know, of design and, and not the celebration of the service behind design.